بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So I want to start off with some headlines of high profile cases that we've seen in recent years. Um, in all of these cases, you have people who are very highly regarded in the community, uh, people who are very respected and beloved by um, children and adults, and they've committed the most heinous and horrific crimes. Okay, thanks. I'm starting off with this information to show that the threat to our children can come from people that we love and respect and admire, and that at times they can actually use that admiration and love to exploit our communities. So as you can see, I have information up there about um, the Boy Scouts, which is an extremely popular uh, organization in the U.S. Um, Jerry Sandusky, who um, was guilty of dozens of child sex abuse charges across many, many years. The Catholic clergy, uh, we always see cases on the news about um, new clergy that are accused of crimes and cover-ups within the Catholic Church. Larry Nassar, which is probably the most recent case um, to come up, and he was the um, perpetrator who was accused of molesting U.S. gymnasts, again, for many, many years. And then there are also cases of Jehovah's Witnesses, um, again, another religious organization um, where child abuse was rampant, and it was also covered up. So um, this chart sums up one of the most important pieces of information I want to share here today. If you're going to come away with anything, I want you to at least come away with this. Um, as you can see, contrary to what most people believe, most, um, most perpetrators are known to the victim and they're not strangers. You know, we tend to think that um, ch perpetrators are, you know, weird looking men who are kind of lurking in playgrounds or schools. Um, but that's actually not the case. 93% of the time, they're known to the victim. 34% of the time, they're family. So, you know, parents, uncles, cousins. Um, and then 59% uh, are acquaintances. So that could be friends, teachers, nannies, babysitters, organization leaders, um, all kinds of people that are known to the victims. And only 7% are strangers. So here are some important facts I also wanted to share. Uh, according to research, one in five girls and one in 20 boys is a victim of child abuse. Now, I know that this, these, are, these figures are alarming, but I also want people to take into account that a lot of abuse cases go unreported because some kids don't never disclose. Um, and even if they do disclose, a lot of families don't report to the authorities. So the numbers could actually be much higher, and I've seen research that points to higher figures. Uh, the most vulnerable ages are between 7 and 13. Nearly 40% are abused by other kids. Um, so they could be friends, classmates, cousins, any other children, basically. And interestingly, also, 40 to 80% of juveniles who commit crimes such as this are victims themselves. 60% of victims never tell anybody. We're going to talk about um, the reasons why that is um, in a few minutes. And then, of course, um, People tend to think that uh, sexual abuse is only a contact crime, but that's not the case. So it could be any kind of behavior that is um, sexually motivated for the perpetrator. So it could be um, watching the child undress, showing the child inappropriate material, um, exposure to the child, anything that would be inappropriate in that sense would still be child abuse. And then most sex offenders do deny their crimes. I wanted to mention this because if a child makes a disclosure and you're, you're automatically thinking, well, I'm going to go ask the person that's being accused, you go and ask that adult and the adult says, oh, no, that's ridiculous. It was a misunderstanding. Of course nothing happened. I want you to really think twice about trusting the accused over the child because the vast majority of allegations are actually true and most sex offenders deny their crimes. So I just want everybody to keep that in mind. Something else I really wanted to address was myths around child abuse. And I think the most prominent one really is stranger danger. So we spend a lot of time teaching our kids to be cautious around strangers, don't talk to strangers, don't take anything from strangers. The famous, you know, don't take candy from a stranger. We don't really teach them how to handle unwanted interactions from people they know, or people they love even. So, you know, most people have this idea that a sex offender looks, you know, unusual or different, but it's actually rarely are they strangers. So we have to make a point to teach our kids to set boundaries and be um, comfortable saying, no, 
this is making me uncomfortable. I don't want to be around that person, whether they're a stranger or not. We also think that children won't remember if they're abused at a young age or they're just going to get over it because they're so young. But that's actually not the case. Uh, the effects of abuse last for many, many years and well into adulthood. Um, and it can impact various areas of a person's life. We'll discuss that in more detail as well. On the other hand, just because a child was abused doesn't mean that they're going to be, you know, distraught or struggling for the rest of their lives. A lot of factors play into um, how a child recovers from trauma, and that includes, you know, believing the child, family support, getting treatment, all kinds of other factors play into that. And then um, it's also unfortunate that you know, a lot of people assume that boys are rarely abused and that they think that it's mostly girls. But I talked earlier about um, the, that it's actually one in 20 boys, and it's probably even higher than that. And boys can be uh, abused by boys and girls, men and women. It's actually estimated that 14% of cases of uh, child abuse against boys are committed by women. And it's also assumed that if a mother is around, that nobody can harm her child. But there have been also cases where, especially if it's someone that's trusted within the family, that the abuse is happening in the same room where the mom is. Um, so again, making sure that we're not thinking about the danger as just coming from strangers, but it could come from anybody within the family or community. We also want to believe that a parent um, can tell if their child is being abused or that the child is immediately going to tell them if they have a close relationship. But again, various actors play into, uh, factors play into that. Um, you know, some kids never tell at all. Some kids wait months or years before telling. Uh, a lot of them think that, you know, they're embarrassed about it. Um, they think no one's going to believe them. They don't want to get the person in trouble, especially if it's someone that's beloved by the family, a family member or um, someone that the family respects. Um, they're afraid that their parents aren't going to love them anymore. Um, they're afraid that uh, they're going to be taken away by child services. Um, sometimes the children even deny the abuse, even when there's evidence that it happened, because they're afraid of all the, the possible repercussions. The other thing also is that perpetrators can play into that. So they can threaten kids that those are the things that would happen to you if you disclose. So then they're not going to tell anybody. And the other side of that that I wanted to address is that there are, uh, you know, parents that I think actually the majority of parents, when, when the kid comes to them and discloses something like this, the initial reaction is denial. No one wants to, to hear that their child suffered something so horrific. Um, so it's actually a very, very common reaction. And the most important thing to remember is in those kind of situations, it's understandable that you would be in denial at first. And what matters really is that you quickly realize that you have to trust your child and take immediate steps to make sure that they're safe. And so even if a, a mom initially says, what, that's ridiculous, there's no way that happened, it doesn't mean that they're a bad parent. It's actually a normal first reaction. Also, sometimes the abuse is minimized. So I know some behaviors seem worse than others, um, but it's important to remember that for a child, abuse is abuse. It's not about, um, you know, only in, for adults um, is uh, sex considered intercourse. But for children, it's not about that at all. It's not about the physical act. It's about um, the betrayal. It's about um, the emotional aspect of it, that there is manipulation and deceit and that their innocence was stolen. That's what stays with them. That's what's the most damaging. It's not about the physical act. So, you know, we shouldn't say things like, well, he only touched, you know, her, her arm, or at least he didn't rape her and, or him, um, because that's not helpful. That's not what stays with the child. Another thing I want to see here, and what uh, Brother Donish was saying as well, is that we want to believe that people in helping professions would never do something like this, uh, would never harm children. But research has actually shown that there are some offenders that choose their profession, especially because it gives them access to children. So there are many clergy and teachers and people in childcare who've said, yes, I, I went into this profession because I have access to kids and no one would question me. So it's important to not assume that just because somebody is a Quran teacher or, you know, the, the 
best babysitter in the neighborhood that you should dismiss any concerns that are brought to your attention. And then lastly, um, I think this is a pretty common myth that sex offender treatment doesn't work um, and that we should just you know, lock up all sex offenders and they're all the same um, and that treatment is useless for them. That's not the case. There are different types of sex offenders. Um, some of, a lot of them actually are individuals who suffered their own traumas when they were kids. Um, and they're dealing with, with um, their own histories of victimization. And some of them feel a lot of remorse for their actions and want help. Now, some don't feel that way and are just predatory. Um, but either way, treatment is very important. And it's an extremely important component in prevention. And I'm, I'm saying this here because if you do come across someone that you personally or professionally know and they've committed a crime like this, um, and you're hesitant about addressing the issue, and you, know, you don't want to embarrass them, they tell you, oh, I'll never do it again. It was just one time, and I don't know what I was thinking. So you're thinking about just letting it slide and not reporting to the authorities. I want you to really think about the importance of treatment in this case. Um, they need to be referred for treatment. And treatment is not all the same. Um, I work in a treatment program. And um, it's individualized based on the person's history, based on their own experiences, based on their risk level. So. I strongly want to encourage everybody to, to really think about that if you ever come across someone who is in this situation. And this is what we need to do for the good of the community and to protect our children, really. And you know, sending them off to another place or marrying them off, that's not going to help anybody. It's not going to help them. It's going to probably put other people in harm's way. Um, so the best thing to do in that situation is to report and um, recommend treatment. So I'm going to talk a little bit about grooming. Uh, Brother Danish mentioned it a little bit. Um, so grooming really is the process where by a perpetrator gains access to a victim. To a victim. Um, it involves an imbalance of power. It involves coercion, manipulation. And the motivation is to get to the victim and to maintain that relationship. Um, and it involves not just the child. It involves the child's caregivers. It even sometimes involves the entire community. So I'm going to go through the steps in, um, involved in grooming. So the first step is identifying and targeting the victim. So the most vulnerable kids uh, for child abuse are kids that come from broken homes, kids who um, single parent homes, kids who are neglected, um, kids who you know they're um, they're not getting a lot of attention at home. They have really you know very busy parents, children with disabilities, children who are quiet. Um, reserved, shy, more passive. So those are the kids that are preyed on um, more often. The next step is gaining trust and access to them. So once the perpetrator identifies the, vic the potential victim, then they, you know, they pay special attention to them. Um, they buy them gifts. They buy them food. Um, they buy them stuff that you know they're lacking at home, and they also offer emotional support. So you know they lend a sympathetic ear if there's there you know if there's stuff going on at home, then they listen to them and they offer them love and support and guidance. And gradually, what's happening is that they're playing a role in the child's life. Um, so they make the child feel like they're the only one that understands them. They're the only one that's supporting them and is going to be really there for them. And with time, what, um, what they end up doing is isolating the child. So they offer them rides. You know, they could drop offs after school. They take them out for uh, meals. Um, they take them to you know, um, sports games. Um, they give them personal lessons, so you know, individualized lessons, so they could tell the parents, "Oh, he's such a special kid, or she's such a, such a special kid." Um, I want to give them, you know, personalized lessons just by themselves to to grow their um, gift. So then they end up having a lot of alone time together, and of course, the parents are none the wiser; they don't know exactly what's going on. And at that point, nothing inappropriate has happened. This is again a process where they're slowly desensitizing the victim and the family to the idea of being alone with the child. Um, and then throughout all this, they're creating secrecy. So you know, they're they're telling the child, um, "Don't tell anybody about our relationship," and you know, "You're so special." You know, "Don't tell anybody about how you know we care for each other and that I'm there for you." Because if you tell, then all of that's going to go away, and we won't be able to go to all these games, and we won't have that special time, and I can't get you gifts and all that stuff. 
Now what happens after this is gradually they start to initiate physical contact. And it doesn't immediately have to be something inappropriate, but it could be, or sexual, but it, what happens is, for example, like Jerry Sandusky, what he used to do was um, he would like gradually touch the boy's legs and then they would wrestle, you know, wrestling first with clothes and then wrestling, you know, with underwear and then um, showering with the boys. So, you know, he is a coach. so showering in locker rooms was normal for the boys but then they he would shower just with one of the boys so it's gradual 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 so that the kids are desensitized so that finally when he does make the uh, an appropriate sexual contact the child isn't going to be as shocked um and uh, and will be less likely to say no now in order to maintain this relationship the the uh, perpetrator is instilling fear in the child because they, they need to control them. So they tell them, you know, if you ever tell anybody, there no one's going to believe you. Um, you know, it's, their, it's your fault because you wanted to be with me and you enjoyed, uh, you know, our trips together. And the, the problem is and why this is so incredibly damaging for kids is because the child is enjoying part of this because, because the perpetrator is making sure that they are. Because the more that the child seems like they're enjoying this experience of you know, going out together, the gifts and the food and the games, um, then the less likely the child's going to say anything, the less likely anyone's going to believe anything is going on because the child seems like they're having a great time. And the child themselves are having a good time, really. So then they're struggling with this idea of, well, but this person, look, they love me and they're helping me and they're the only one in, in my life that cares about me, but they're hurting me. So they're struggling with this awful um, dilemma. And then the perpetrator feeds off of that and contributes to it. Now, I also want to say that this is not common in all cases. It, it's um, in some scenarios, this doesn't happen at all. Um, and there's just coercion and fear. It doesn't have to be any grooming. Um, but again, this is such an important thing to think about because, you know, we um, perpetrators are, are not, they don't have to be someone who's, you know, scary and, um, you know, it's a one-time thing it, um, and the child is going to tell right away. And I think that's what everybody has, most people have in their mind that that's what's going to happen, but that's not the case. And with people that employ grooming, it's so incredibly dangerous to our community because these are the people that seem like they're wonderful. I mean, everybody loved Jerry Sandusky. They thought he was the most amazing guy looking after all these troubled children, created an after-school organization for troubled kids. Everybody loved him. Um, and these people make sure that the community thinks that about them because that's going to get them more access. And if anybody says anything, no one's going to believe them. So they have access for a much longer time. They get away with whatever they want. So it's incredibly dangerous. So how do you know if your child is being abused? So there's um, uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is normal versus abnormal behaviors, um, sexual behaviors. So um, I'm not going to talk about it by developmental stages, but typically, really what you should be thinking about is what's normal for my child's age. And to help, to get help with that, the best thing to do is to talk to your pediatrician or primary care physician to figure out, okay, you know, my child's acting this way, is that normal for their age? Um, but just kind of general ideas uh, are, you know, can they be redirected? If they're doing something inappropriate and you keep telling them to stop and they're not stopping it, that's concerning. If they know, you know, knowledge that's inappropriate for their developmental stage, that's also concerning. Um, if they're stimulating um, inappropriate adult acts, that's also very concerning because where did they learn that from? Um, if they manipulate other children to, you know, to abuse the children or having another child abuse them, that's also inappropriate and concerning. Um, if they're talking in an inappropriate manner, um, if being around other adults is, um, causes them excessive agitation, um, anything like that, that's all abnormal behavior. And then um, STDs also are a big tell. So um, if a child um, has an STD, then that's uh, obviously concerning because where did they get that from? And then, um, of course, mental health symptoms. So, you know, if they're withdrawn, if they're afraid, they seem that, you know, they're afraid, they're depressed, um, a suicide attempt, um, they're very angry and rebellious. Um, for no reason, right? So think about developmental stage. Is this appropriate for their developmental stage or not? Um, and then witnessing, of course. If it was witnessed, then you 
um, that's evidence. Using alcohol or drugs at an early age. So alcohol and drugs or you know, substances in general are um, commonly used in victims of trauma. They're, coping, they're unhealthy coping mechanisms. So if that's used, then that's concerning as well. And then chronic physical symptoms, you know, like stomach pain, headaches. Um, and then with regards to physical findings, so a lot of people think that if a child is abused, then there's going to be physical findings, and, like, and that's the way to tell if something happened. That's not the case. Actually, kids heal much faster than adults. So in a lot of cases, even with, you know, terrible abuse, there, there are no physical findings. They do a checkup and there's nothing there. So if you're going to rely, if you have other evidence, and the physical findings seem to point like, to the um, effect that nothing happened, I would not go with the physical findings because uh, they're actually uncommon. And then lastly, disclosure. If there is disclosure, you want to investigate. So effects on children. So I, um, I split this into short-term and long-term effects. Um, and I do want to say beforehand that, you know, sometimes um, the events that happen after the abuse can be as damaging to the kids as the actual abuse itself. So, you know, for example, not being believed, um, having to go through the legal system, um, all of that can be re-traumatizing. And in fact, sexually abused children who tell and are not believed or who never tell at all um, are at greater risk of emotional, um, social, and physical problems that can go well into adulthood. <laughs> Um, now, short-term short effects include regressive behaviors, which basically means that they're, um, they're displaying behaviors that are not appropriate for their developmental stage. So, like, um, you know, thumb sucking, bedwetting, um, uh, you know, if they stop talking. So, like, you know, like a six-year-old acting suddenly like a two- or three-year-old. Um, sleep disturbances, eating problems, they, you know, they stop doing well at school, they don't want to go to school, they failed all their classes, they don't want to hang out with their friends. Those are all um, effects and signs. Long-term effects include substance abuse, as I mentioned earlier, that's a common um, coping mechanism. Dissociation, which means um, basically uh, kids who experience trauma, especially this kind of trauma, um, can, because of how uh, incredibly overwhelming the experience is, they can uh, emotionally detach themselves from the situation. So they might, may not even have memories of the abuse because it's so incredibly traumatizing. And this is especially true in cases of incest. Um, other mental health symptoms include depression, anxiety, PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, suicide attempts, eating disorders, Physical health problems, so adults with a history of a child abuse are 30% more likely to have a serious medical condition like diabetes, cancer, heart problems, stroke, and hypertension. So as you can see, it's extremely damaging um, throughout the lifespan. And then, of course, they could have difficulties in their relationships and, you know, adult relationships. They can feel anger at the abuser anger at their families for not protecting them, and anger at themselves because they felt like they could have been able to stop the abuse. And then finally, um, uh, research has shown that uh, someone who was victimized is highly likely to be re-victimized again. So they're likely to be traumatized again. Uh, we don't have time to talk about that now here, but if anybody has a question about this in the Q&A, I will gladly explain that phenomenon. Okay, so what to do to protect your child from abuse? So you want to carefully screen the people you, that are in contact with your child. Don't assume that just because, you know, they're high standing in the community that they're automatically safe at all. We want to make sure, you know, any, um, any uh, gut feeling you have, any doubts you have, you want to go with that. Um, don't ignore suspicious behavior. Um, again, if, even if they're the most respected and beloved teacher or leader, because remember, if that person employed grooming, that means that they're, they actually made an effort to become the most beloved teacher and, um, and leader so that they can have access. Um, you also don't want to force your child to give and receive um, affection. So, you know, I know even, you know, we, my husband does this at home. Like when someone comes over, oh, you know, he tells my son to go and hug and kiss the person that's coming. And we all do that. It's part of our culture. Um, we, we, we really want to, um, to, you know, be close to each other and show love and affection to each other. So the, the issue, though, with that is that if your child doesn't want to do, doesn't feel like doing that, 
it's really best to, to not force them. And I'm not saying that if they don't want to hug and kiss someone who comes in the door, that means that that person is a danger to them. Absolutely not, because we all know kids, sometimes they're shy or they just don't feel like it, and that's totally fine. But why I'm saying this here is because you want to make your child feel like it's okay for them to set a boundary. It's okay for them to say, no, I don't want to hug and kiss that person. Because God forbid, if some, at some point there is a person there that is a danger to them, you want them to feel like they can say no and that they have a right to say no. Similarly, we teach our kids to always respect and obey elders, which is obviously, you know, in general a good thing, but we also want to teach them that if they feel unsafe around someone, even if they are the most respected person in the community, that it's okay for them to also set a boundary and say, no, I don't want to be around that person. Um, and that just because they're kids doesn't mean they're any less worthy of our respect and um, or the, they're any less valuable. We also tend to give, you know, cutesy names to body parts when, uh, when they're kids. Um, but, you know, and I think also because we feel like if we say those words, it's ayyib. So the problem with that, though, is that if, again, God forbid, a child were to be abused and they're going to disclose to somebody, they may not feel comfortable disclosing to you because maybe it's someone that you know, maybe it's someone in your house, maybe someone that you admire or love. They may want to disclose to you know, their friend's mom or their teacher. And they might use a word that the teacher has no idea what they're talking about. So the teacher might dismiss it, and then that's it. The child's never going to disclose again. So it's important to, um, to give the, your kids the tools to be able to advocate for themselves. Now, if your child appears distraught around a specific person, doesn't want to be alone with them, um, that's something also to take into account. Um, you want to talk to your child about prevention, you know, teach them that no one can touch them in certain places, that they should immediately tell if they feel uncomfortable. There's a lot of books out there, a lot of information about how to do this. Um, I saw a book the other day called C is for Consent, and it was for younger kids, so you can start that um, conversation early. You also want to be open to whatever your child wants to tell you. Um, if they say they have a secret, you don't want to dismiss it because maybe they're testing the waters to tell you something else. And this is not necessarily just about themselves. You know, maybe they saw something that's going on with another child and they, they feel like um, they want to tell somebody. And then that gives you an opportunity to really step up and, and be um, someone who's, uh, you know, protecting your community. Um, and finally, like I said, believe a child if they tell you something is going on because the cost of disbelieving really is much higher than the cost of you know, believing them and then finding out that it was not a true accusation. So this is an app that was created um, by Childhood USA with a nonprofit called Darkness to Light. Um, it's a really great app it's, um, to, about child prevention, basically, uh, child abuse prevention. Um, and it has a lot of information. I don't know if you can see it clearly, but um, it has education, organization safety checklists, um, uh, and it also, I, I believe, has uh, information on how to report child abuse. The last thing I'm going to say is about mandatory reporting. So mandatory reporting basically means um, that you know people who are in uh, in professions where they are always around children, they are legally um, obligated to report suspected abuse to the authorities. They have to, or else they get in trouble. Um, I personally think that everybody should be a mandated, mandated reporter. I think if you suspect anything, it should be reported to the authorities. Now, um, I, the thing I, I also wanted to impart here is that it could be absolutely anonymous, so no one will know that you made a report. And also, it's suspected abuse. So it's not like you know for sure. You're just reporting suspected abuse. So there's some evidence that something might be going on, and you want to make sure that you know that a child is safe. Best to report. There'll be an investigation, and then if nothing comes of it, that's fine. But you may be protecting one child or many in the community by reporting. And um, there's a website that we'll put on in Sheikh's clothing about um, how to report child abuse. And then these are more resources um, uh, about child abuse, just information, um, and then uh, Brother Danish's website and Jake's clothing and um, some hotlines as well that we'll have on the website. And that's it for me. Thank you very much.